Thank you, Evan. Imagine there's no Evan. Yes. And thank you, St. Patrick, uh, for all you guys' work. What you guys are doing is pretty amazing, and uh, it's uh, encouraging that you have this group that just spontaneously started of, I guess it's a high compliment to say a group of troublemakers, right, <laughs> who uh, want to fight back and want to promote science and reason. And, and I get to talk to groups all over the country, and it's, everybody's different, of course, but there's a certain sameness, there's a certain excitement all over the country, hundreds of free thought campus, atheist, skeptic, humanist groups. And like 20, 25 years ago when I started doing this, I could only think of maybe a half dozen. But now, this generation is totally different. And in Australia, there's about 25 campus groups that have come together, and they started a national free thought group. And it's the same kind of infection. It's kind of neat. It's like a bottom-up thing. It's not like, it's not like somebody from the Vatican came here and, you know, um, from, and started to missionize and turn you guys into non-believers. You just did it on your own, right? Your own thinking. And that's kind of that's neat. So um, free thought doesn't need missionaries. doesn't need proselytizing or evangelist. It's just your own, your own thoughts, and that's what free thought is. I used to preach, as you know. I used to travel the country preaching the good news of the gospel for 19 years. But then uh, I'm going to tell my story um, about why, how and why it changed. But there's a piano here. And I thought I would play a couple songs. One of them was like the first song I wrote since I became an atheist. After years of being an evangelist, I realized that when you're, when you're selling salvation, when you sell anything, you have to convince the person they need it. You just can't go to somebody and say, here, buy this, right? If you're selling salvation, what you're really selling first is damnation. You have to convince people, you are damned, you are bad, there's a hell, and you are not, you're worthy of eternal damnation, but there's an answer. Jesus died for your sins. So before you can even think about salvation, you have to buy into the whole idea that you're rotten, that you're a sinner, that, you're, that there's something wrong with you, original sin and guilt and all that. So half the job of my evangel, evangelical career was convincing people how bad they were. And then Jesus came and for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that he washed away your sins and then you can be saved. So the first song I wrote as an atheist is called you can't win with original sin. <laughs> doesn't even matter how intelligent or kind you may have been. You just can't win. It was all over before it began. You were doomed in the fall of man. You can't win. I was dead. I was dead before my life had begun. I was dead because of something my great, 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 great grandparents had done. That's no fun. Adam and Eve didn't do any wrong. They were set up all along. They couldn't win. I've been told I must believe on Jesus Christ to be saved. But first, I must admit that I am totally depraved. No way. Before you go pointing that finger of blame, just remember, Eve was framed. She couldn't win. insecure that he needs to send me to hell is the kind of God who'd probably get a big kick out of damning all the Christians as well you never could tell 
It was all over before it began. I was doomed in the fall of man. But as a skeptic, I must insist, Adam and Eve didn't really exist. Neither does God then for that matter. And until the day that old myth is shattered, we cannot win. No, you just can't win. Did you know the tango was outlawed by the church? The tango was the sensuous, sexual, uh, seductive music. And in the 20s, anybody, people could lose their jobs if they were caught dancing the tango. It was outlawed. So, of course, what did everybody want to dance, you know? <laughs> That's the best way. Outlaw a book, so everybody's going to want to read it. But um, um, what better style then? For the song, we had a billboard, and I'll tell you about some of our billboards. A billboard that said, Beware of Dogma. Beware of dogma, it has a bite. Beware of dogma, it wants a fight. Beware of dogma, it will ignite a holy war by itself. Beware of dogma. It'll trap your mind, religious dogma. It'll make you blind, beware of dogma. It's not designed to let you think for yourself. If we let it out in the universe, there will be no doubt. Everything is worse. Beware of dogma, don't let it loose, that unchained dogma, it'll reproduce, tie up your dogma, there's no excuse for ignorance anymore. Please, clean up after your dogma. <laughs> It's the final week of the school year, but you haven't studied your best. So you stay up and cram for the final exam and pray for God's help on the test. Then you answer the questions with assurance that the Lord will help you sail through. When the results are returned, what have you learned? God's no smarter than you. <laughs> Nothing fails like prayer. Nothing fails like prayer. Use your mind and you will find that nothing fails like prayer. You ask a supernatural power for sunshine on your wedding day. Then along comes a thunder shower, washes your prayers away. When things go right, you praise the Almighty and you give thanks in Jesus' name. But when things go wrong, you change your song and God never gets the blame. Nothing fails like prayer. Nothing fails like prayer. Use your mind and you will find that nothing fails like prayer. The farmers pray for precipitation then they say, in God we trust. Then along comes a drought and dries their crops out, turns their prayers into dust. The next time they need some assistance, they should take the advice of Mark Twain, who said, it's better to check the weather report before you pray for rain. Nothing fails like prayer. Nothing fails like prayer. Use your mind and you will find that nothing fails like prayer.
Well, that's three verses of that song. <laughs> the piano's like a magnet. It's like, oh, let's do some. Um, maybe I'll do one or two more songs uh, that, that fit the talk. But I used to be a Christian musician, and I used to travel, and I started out as an associate pastor of three different churches in California. I was born and raised in Southern California. And... Uh, I preached up in this area, too, um, lived up in Sonora for a while, up in the gold country. And I, um, I also wrote Christian musicals, and I'm still getting royalties, even wow. today, which is <laughs> it's kind of neat. I forget all about it, and they're not selling that much like they did in the 70s, but still, once a year, I get this check from the Christian publisher. And uh, last year, I got a check for $1,018 or something like that. And so I signed it over to the Women's Medical Fund, which helps poor women pay for abortions. And the bookkeeper... <laughs> uh, and by the way, a lot of Christians also support a woman's right to abortion. So it's, that's, yeah. you know, but it's not just an atheist thing. But uh, the bookkeeper, um, Katie, she said, should I send a thank you letter to the pub Christian publisher <laughs> for this? Uh, but uh, I was a preacher. I was an evangelist. I... Um, I'd been, I'd been born again as a young teenager. I was raised in a Christian family, but, you know, I used to preach that God doesn't have any grandchildren. God has his, just children, you know. You, you don't become a, a Christian just by being born into a Christian family. You have to make your own decision. And I did. I confessed my sins. I accepted the death of Jesus on the cross. I asked him to come into my heart to, be, to, to wash away my sins, make me a new creature, and I became a born again, and I believed it. I read the Bible, and I thought, wow, this is amazing. And I, and I thought, how lucky was I? I was born into the right family, in the right religion, in the right country, <laughs> in the right time of history, because the world's ending any minute. In fact, <laughs> how much time do we have left? Call Harold. Harold, um, you know, one of these days, somebody's going to be right. <laughs> but who's going to be around to say, I told you so? But um, who knows? Um, by the way, the Freedom from Religion Foundation uh, has taken out 40 billboards in the Bay Area this week uh, uh, protesting or, or uh, commenting on the end of the world, which is supposed to be tonight. Um, and uh, I, I, don't, I can't show them to you, but there's uh, five or six different billboards one of them just says, still here. <laughs> uh, another one says, from 2005 to 2009, Family Radio raised $80 million. And we had the CNN citation for that. Sometimes it pays to be wrong. <laughs> that's, that's one of our billboards. Uh, we have another one that has three different clocks on it, and they're all like right at midnight, and it says, uh, fool me once. And the one says... 1994, then the other one says May of 2011, and still here, <laughs> still wrong, wrong again, and then October 21st, 2011, still wrong. Um, there's another one that's, uh, it's got these, it's black with the flames burning, and it says every day is judgment day. Use your judgment, use reason, you know. So uh, if you're driving through, uh, it's Oakland and Richmond and a whole bunch of those towns, and there's a few over in uh, San Francisco as well that are up for this whole month. And uh, tomorrow, I guess people will be reading them going, yeah, I guess, all right. But I was that guy. I was, when I was a teenager, I really thought the world was ending. It was going to be like a thief in the night. No man knows the hour, but we were convinced. The signs were right. The, the, the fig tree, you know, that Jesus talked about, and the nation of Israel, and the wars, and the earthquakes, and uh, this, this is the time, this is it now. This generation shall not pass, Jesus said. And so it's been how, since 1948, it's been that generation. And, and um, I just knew it was true. And I remember when I was in college, I went to a, a Christian, Christian college. Um, Hal Lindsey, the author of The Late Great Planet Earth, came. He talked. In fact, I helped invite him in as part of the Christian life team there. And Hal Lindsey assured us, if you read the Bible and you interpret it right, this is it. He said the second coming of Jesus couldn't possibly be any later than the mid-1980s. And I remember thinking, that late? 
I thought it was going to be like maybe, and who knows, it could be tonight, it could be, are, and are you ready to meet God? If it happened, are you ready? And I, when I was 15, I accepted what I was convinced was a calling. I, I felt it, I felt the spirit, I felt this presence, and I just got goosebumps, and uh, I was praying, and I was, uh, you know, what am I going to do with the rest of my life, what little is left of it? I didn't think I was even going to go to college and get married or any of that, I just thought the world was going to end. We need to bring souls into the kingdom. And so... I didn't realize at the time, but every generation of Christians has had a group that's thought they were in the end time. Even in the New Testament, Paul said it was going to be quick. You know, Jesus said some of his disciples wouldn't taste death until the end came. And I, there's some kind of an arrogant thing that we fancy that we, are, we get to be the, actually in the end times, and isn't that special? Um, and in the New Testament, it says, even so, Lord, come quickly. I don't know about you, but 2,000 years doesn't sound like quickly to me, but... Maybe a, a day is as a thousand years. Who knows? But I really believed it, and I thought, and I thought, I don't have to go to college or get a degree. I can start preaching now, and I did. I was a teenager. I started carrying my Bible to school. I was instrumental in leading my agnostic Spanish teacher to Jesus, and we had, and he and I planned these Bible classes on campus, which were illegal, by the way. But we did it because there's the higher there's a higher authority than the Constitution. Did you know know that? There's a higher moral authority than the government. So. Um, I was the guy on campus. I was the guy that was going up to people and knocking on doors and preaching and playing the piano and singing. And, and I was so excited and I was so positive and I would pray and I would get, I'd see answers to prayer and I would see miracles and I would get goosebumps when I was talking to Jesus and all that. And In fact, I can still do that right now as an atheist. I won't do it here, but <laughs> I can... I'm one of those people, and everybody's different. In this room, there's probably a distribution of types. Some of you might be over here on this tail end of the bell curve like me, very susceptible to mystical experiences. Well, I was, and I am still. I can still, I can go back somewhere quiet and speak in tongues, and all those feelings come back. Whoa, and I can feel this kind of parent figure, a peace that passes understanding, and I get goosebumps, and it's a pretty amazing thing. I have atheist friends who think that religious people are just faking it. Well, they're not. Well, some of them. They're, I mean, some of you probably went to church and you were looking around, I don't feel anything. Well, you're over here on this side of the distribution. Like Richard Dawkins, he even put on the helmet and nothing. And James Randi, the same thing. James Randi's, what's everybody making a big deal? But some of you in this room know what I'm talking about, don't you? You've had religious experiences, and they're very real. They don't point to anything outside the mind, but they're very powerful things that happen in the brain. And I didn't realize it at the time, but goosebumps were not evidence of the Holy Spirit. <laughs> goosebumps, do you know what? Goosebumps are evidence of evolution. Did you know that? Why do we get goosebumps? What's the point of getting goosebumps? Temperature well, yeah, because our ancestors were hairier, Right? And their fur, their hair, for thermal control, you've seen animals or birds, you know, they fluff up for the, for when it's cold, or to look larger to scare off an attacker, right? You've seen animals do that. So our ancestors used that. Well, this, it's an atavism. It's something we inherited. We don't use it anymore, but it's an evidence that we evolved from ancestors who did use their, fluff up their hair for those reasons. But at the time, I thought, no, goosebumps are actually powerful evidence of the Holy Spirit. And uh, I thought, who could possibly deny the reality of God? I worked for a while with Catherine Kuhlman, the faith healer. I was the teenage choir librarian for her when she came to Los Angeles, her faith healing meetings. And boy, it was so amazing. And I thought, you skeptics must be blind. You non-believers, what's wrong with you? You must be ill or sick or blind or just mean people because how... How can you deny it? And why would you? Why would you not want this beautiful message that, that I have and that I was preaching? And I was the guy, I used to think that you didn't know it, but you secretly were starving for what I had and what the gospel had. And I would walk up to, you know, there's people like that on just about every campus, right, who have that, you know, well, I was that guy. In, uh, in the foreword to my book, Godless, Richard Dawkins writes, and I still don't know if this is a compliment, but I'll pretend, I'll pretend like it is. <laughs> Richard Dawkins writes, Dan Barker is the most eloquent witness of internal delusion that I know. <laughs> That's a compliment. That's a compliment. 
But you can see his point. He and Christopher Hitchens and Daniel Dennett and Sam Harris, they're wonderful. They're brilliant, but they're looking at it from the outside, right? They're analyzing it from the outside in. They've never felt it or lived it or understood it, right? So what's it like to actually be a true believer and, and feeling these things and living the life? And um, Dawkins goes on to say in the foreword, Dan was not just a preacher. He was the kind of preacher you would not want to sit next to on a bus. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, you know, there's people like that, missionaries, proselytizers, they're all over. I mean, that's how religions grow. You know, The Mormons go over to England and they talk to people on the street about the angel Moroni and the gold tablets and the magic hat and the, you know. And then they say, the people say, okay. And then they go back to Utah with them, right? So how do you explain the gullibility? Well, it's there. And it was your lucky day when God directed you. You didn't know this because there's no coincidences in Christianity. All things work together. It was your lucky day when God had you sit next to me on the bus. That was a, there was a purpose for that. It wasn't just some random thing. I would talk with you for a while. We would chit-chat. And then and when I tell this, it's so embarrassing because it's so crude and obvious. And You know what I mean? It's just so stupid, but it works. It does. It works. If you want to be an evangelist or missionary... Do these things because it works. Not with everybody. Probably most people in this room wouldn't. But there's a whole bunch of people in the bell curve of whatever who are susceptible and are looking for meaning. And I would look over at you for a minute and say, okay, well, excuse me for saying this. I hope you don't think I'm intruding, but you're having some real problems in your life right now, aren't you? <laughs> How does he know? <laughs> And you're, you're struggling with a personal relationship right now, aren't you? <laughs> it's funny, and it's embarrassing, but this works. Talk to people like that in these tones of, you know, um, and well, you know what? I know how you feel, because I used to feel that way too. It's like you're a ship without a rudder, and what's the meaning of life? Why are you here? What, how do you make decisions? When you, <coughs> where, what's it all about? You know, where's, where do you find real peace and happiness? But uh, I was just like that, and I understand, and you know what? I found Jesus, and Jesus is the answer, and Jesus changes everything. He'll make you a new creature if you give your life to him, and you'd be surprised how many people agree with that and how few people over those 19 years actually said anything critical. I can only think of one or two people in that whole time. Who, one guy was in Mexico City who just sort of laughed at me and, and um, walked away, and another guy was a biker. I remember him, too. But, but usually most people, I don't know if it's most people, but a lot of people have this sort of built-in deference to somebody who's speaking religiously. It's like, oh, I don't have all the answers, but this guy seems, look at he seems to have, and I, I, you know, maybe this is, you know. How do you explain somebody like Joseph Smith or, or Muhammad or other religious leaders? They must have this sort of confidence that's infectious and people are attracted to it for some reason. And it works. And I, and I didn't think it was me. I thought it was God and the Holy Spirit. And so I was preaching as a teenager. I went to um, Christian college, Azusa Pacific. And I didn't think I was going to graduate. I thought the world was going to end. You know, Jesus is coming any minute. And, um, but I did. And um, I, I got married just right out of college. Carol was a singer. and We had like a, a musical ministry in that. And she was from the Friends background. They're sort of modern-day Quakers. And so my first job was as an associate pastor in a friend's church. And then, but my family was more charismatic Pentecostal background. And so then after a couple of years, I went to an Assembly of God church. And I was an associate pastor there. And I'm glad I did that. The Assemblies of God are an interesting American phenomenon. They're very sweet people, very sincere. I really liked a lot of them, but they were way too noisy for my taste. You know, the speaking in tongues and the gifts of the Spirit and the falling on the floor and all that stuff. We actually thought that we had the true, the true presence of God. And all these other churches were just empty, formal, doctrinal. You know, they had a form of godliness but denied the power thereof. When we were in church, we were actually in the presence of God, really speaking to us, not from some old dry scriptures, but today, talking and revealing. And it was exciting. Pretty neat. I mean, imagine that. You're in touch with this powerful spirit that's coming down and talking to you. 
pretty neat thing. Um, and um, then I went to another church in, up in Central California, up in uh, Sonora, uh, up in the gold country, for about a year and a half, too, as an associate pastor. But um, I really saw myself as an evangelist, not so much as a local stay in one place kind of preacher, but as an evangelist who was out winning souls, bringing people into the kingdom. And um, so I went on an eight-year cross-country evangelism, thinking, you know, maybe Jesus is going to wait long enough for us to do, preach one more sermon and bring some more. And we had altar calls, and we uh, uh, preached and sang, and then I started having little kids, and I was driving this little yellow Chevy Nova around the country. All of our stuff was in storage, no income. We didn't charge. We just took love offerings. Why, why would we need to save money? The world's going to end. You know, why, we, why even care about any of that? And sometimes after the meetings, if they took a love offering, we would open the envelope to see if there's enough cash to get to the next church. We were like, it was that kind of a thing. Really living, living by faith. Not just having faith, but living by faith. Trusting, you know. And within different religious communities, people help each other. So there was help from people helping our ministry. And, you know, within the Jewish community, Jews are very generous and help other Jews. And with the Muslim community, it's the same thing. You find a community of believers that are together in some way, and there's this tendency to want to help and give to each other. We thought it was God helping us, but it was really human beings helping, you know, humans who are naturally compassionate, as, as most of us are. So um, I loved it. I thought, boy, being called to preach was just the most amazing you know, amazing thing. I spent two years in Mexico as a missionary, converting Catholics into Christians, basically. And <laughs> I'm so embarrassed now to think about that. Um, last November, I went down to Mexico City for the first time as an atheist. I went back to Mexico. There's now a national atheism organization in, in Mexico, and they had their first annual conference, and I went down there, and uh, I apologized to them and I confessed my sins to these atheists. <laughs> I confessed the sin of me coming down to try to missionize this poor, dark, lost country as if we American Protestants had the true light of the gospel. And those, you know, those, um, those, those poor Mexicans, and they all stood up and they absolved me of my sin. <laughs> and so now I can go back there and hold my head up again and mix it. I mean, think of the arrogance. Think of the, the, whole, the whole idea of missionizing another country. It, you know, not just the physical occupation and invasion that's happened, but this whole idea that you need to change these people. Like the, the uh, Massachusetts Bay, Bay Colony, when they came across over on the Mayflower and that. You know what their motto was, their logo? Do you know that story? If you studied early American history? The Massachusetts Bay Colony, their logo was the picture of a Native American with arrows in one hand and bows in the other, and this voice bubble coming out of its mouth saying, come over here and help us. That's what it was. Come over here and help us. They, like they were standing on the shore waiting, please help us in our darkness. You know? Well, that's kind of how I thought. You know? And we raised money and we could go down into Mexico and preach. And I spent a couple years down there. And uh, I was on a, um, a tour going through Ohio in 75. And uh, a week of meetings fell through. And I, I didn't care. I thought, you know, all things work together for good. Whatever happens is God's will. I'm not going to fight, you know. And so there must be some good coming out of this. I spent a week in this home of this pastor. And down in the basement there was a piano. And I wrote a musical. And I thought, when I get back to California, then we'll perform this with the church up in, up in Sonora. It was a little, little tiny gold mining town called Standard, if you know where that is. Uh, I don't think that church is there anymore. But um, it was the Standard Community Christian Center, a Christian church out of the disciples' tradition, but it was a bit of a renegade church because they were a charismatic flavor of, of that church. So I thought when I get back, then for Christmas, as a Christmas musical, then the, we can perform this musical for the kids. Uh, prior to that, I'd been working a lot in Christian recording. And back in the 60s, I had worked with Manuel Bonilla, who was, and I think still is, the leading Christian Spanish-speaking recording artist in the world. He, he's a huge name, and I, I, I don't know how big he is now, but he was huge. He and I met down in Mexico, and he was just in a little dusty church, Adobe Church, and he was playing his guitar. And uh, he came up to the United States. He said, I want to make records in the U.S. And that's before he was, like, big and famous. 
I got to make, produce his first U.S. album when I was 16. I went into the studio. I didn't know much what I was doing, but we produced this little album. It was just mono, and it was He Touched Me in Spanish. Mi Atocado was the name of the song. And that record went on to become a big deal and was played all over, like in 15 countries. And I remember hearing it on the radio with, with my simple little piano part and him playing guitar. It was, it was heartfelt. It was, it was basic, you know, simple, simple music. So Manuel and I went on over the years uh, and when he started to become quite famous. So I did a lot of record production for him. and did a lot of his arranging. We also did some trailblazing children's Christian albums in Spanish that had never been done. And three or four albums that we came up with using really good Hollywood musicians. I mean, using real talent and, and good arranging. And so um, I was involved as sort of, I didn't think of it as a career. I thought of it as a ministry. And I hardly even charged. I should have charged, you know. <laughs> People were making money in that business. And I just thought, this is one way I can help Jesus and bring the gospel in. And Manuel well paid, but it was, you know, simple. You know, it wasn't, we didn't get rich. But I think he got rich. But um, So I wrote this musical. And then I came back to California in this, the end of the summer of 75. And I was doing some transcription for a woman who was writing some children's songs, and I told her about my musical, and she said, oh, well, I know Man of Music is looking for a Christmas musical. You should go show it to him. And I thought, oh, you mean publish? No, they're not going to want to see. But I, I called him up, and, and Carl Fair and uh, um, um, Hal said, well, come on, let's see it, because they said, we're praying. We were praying for God to bring us a new children's musical for Christmas. So I went in there. I took my little penciled paper manuscript, and uh, Carl was there. He, and Carl and I are still good friends, actually. He's in his 80s now. He lives in Austin. But uh, I, he remembers that day, too. I walked in. And he said, okay, play, us, play the musical. So I sat down. I started playing, like, the first few bars of the introduction. You know, it's like a... You know, and then uh, he said, stop. He grabbed my arm and said, stop. And I said, what? And he said, I can tell you right now. We're going to publish this. It's going to be one of our best sellers. It's what we've been praying for. And I said, but you haven't heard anything. He said, I've heard enough. I know this is going to be good. And they did. They didn't change a thing. They published it. And it did become their best seller for like two or three years. The musical was called Mary Had a Little Lamb. Oh <laughs> and you might laugh, but the that's because you're probably theologically blind. You probably don't understand the deep significance of that title. Mary was the mother of Jesus, right? And Jesus was the Lamb of God. Get it? He didn't know you were going to get such deep uh, messages here. And it was the Christmas musical th through the eyes of the animals who were there. The donkey, the camels, you know, the sheep and all that stuff. The rooster who crowed uh, and... Um, and they wanted a follow-up because it did well. Suddenly I was getting invited to be a Christian composer. And, and so they, I, they took a bunch of my other songs too. And then uh, Robert Schuller's Hour of Power sang one of my songs on national TV once. Uh, and um, so I was invited to preach, but now I was getting invited to do like musical stuff more than preaching. You know what I mean? Like a guest conductor, the composer is coming to do this. Which I thought, okay, well, all things work together for good. This is what God wants my ministry in the few remaining days that are left. <laughs> uh, and I remember once I went to this church in East Los Angeles who had performed Mary Had a Little Lamb, and the adults dressed up like animals, and it was pretty cute what they did. But I was standing on that stage on the platform by the pulpit, and above, the, above that whole pulpit was a big hand-painted sign that said, Jesus is coming soon. And I noticed behind it there were cobwebs and the paint was peeling off over here. And it was like, <laughs> wouldn't that have been a great photo if I, you know, if I'd only thought, I was a believer then, but if I'd only thought, you know, what a great, you know, Jesus is always coming soon. He's coming any minute, you know, and that's what I thought. He was coming any, any time now. But um, the publisher wanted a follow-up for Easter. He said, why don't you do, you, this one's been successful, and they recorded it, and it was translated in a bunch of languages, and uh, how about another one for Easter? We'll do a sequel. So I wrote one for Easter, and guess what the title of that was? His Fleece Was White as Snow. <laughs> <laughs> and you laugh because you still lack spiritual insight. 
Because the whole idea of the sacrifice of the lamb was a type, they say in theology, foreshadowing Jesus, who would be the final Passover sacrifice, who would die for our sins. And, of course, they had to sacrifice the purest animal, the one that was unblemished. So his fleece was white as snow. And Jesus never sinned, according to the Bible, so he was unblemished by sin, so he was the perfect white-haired sac white sacrifice, or white wool sacrifice. And so I actually killed off the lead character in that musical. You know, Snowy was the name of the... Snowy meets the news with mixed feelings that he's been chosen. Wow, you're the chosen, and what a great honor. And he's going, yeah. Uh, uh, but um, anyway, that one, that one sold too, and it's still selling it. And... Uh, and as I said, I'm still getting royalties from those musicals and other things. I worked with word, word books for a while and word music for a while with some uh, children's educational. I was also working with a company called Gospel Light, which is one of the curriculum, Sunday school curriculum and VBS. Do you know what VBS is? Vacation Bible, Vacation Bible School. And for a number of years, I wrote their mini musicale what it was called. It was just a three or four song short musical that the kids at the end of the week would perform. And um, so what happened? I was a fundamentalist Christian, Bible-believing, true believer, uh, absolutistic in my mind, you know, because there's a verse in the Bible where it says, you should be cold or hot, because if you're lukewarm, I'll spit you out of my mouth. The mindset of a fundamentalist and not all Christians are like this, so I'm not painting them all with the same brush. I mean, there's a lot of smart, sophisticated, subtlety Christians who know more than the fundamentalists. But the fundamentalists that I was, the extreme conservative end of the born-again evangelical spectrum, the mindset of fundamentalists is a binary brain. It's either right or wrong, good or evil, black or white, yes or no. That's how I thought, and that's how fundamentalists in all religions think. It's, it's a, there's no middle ground in their thinking, it, which might explain why it's hard for you sometimes to talk to people like that, because you feel like you're talking a foreign language. Well, you know what's happening. Most of our lives are lived in the relativistic, situational, or counterfactual, or you know what I mean. There, most of our lives are in the gray area, and if you use words like that to a fundamentalist, it has to go one way or the other in their brain. It has to go, oh, this is, this is bad, or this is good. Nothing can be half good, I mean, in, at least in the mind of the way I was at that time. So there was no way back then, as a fundamentalist believer, waiting for the second coming of Jesus, there was no way that I was just going to wake up one morning and then go, oh, ha, ha, silly me, there's no God. Oh, how could I have been so stupid? How, oh, no, what was I thinking? Because I, I lived it, I felt it, I believed it, I, I lived by faith, and I have, there's Christians that tell me today, well, Dan, you couldn't have been a true Christian because if you had been, you wouldn't have left. You really weren't. You were pretending. You, if you really felt it like I feel it, if you really knew it like I know it, and I say to them, but I did. I preached it. And besides, who are you to say? The Bible says you shall know them by their fruits. The Bible says, and my life exhibited the fruits of the Spirit, and I was out living and 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 preaching and giving and sacrificing and, and living the whole life and feeling it. But so here I was as a preacher expecting the world to end and inviting people to accept the love of Jesus and be saved from their sins and, and the free gift of heaven and all that. And I started getting invited because of my music to a broader cross-section of Christian churches. And what happened in my exodus from fundamentalist Christian to outspoken atheist was not just hopping in one day. It was a gradual process of moving across the Christian theological spectrum. That's what happened to me. Uh, I started out over here, and then I started bumping into other flavors of Christians. And I learned gradually that there is no one Christianity. There's probably as many different Christianities as there are Christians. There's all these different subsets and different types of interpretations and different ways of thinking and all that, and, and we all know that. In fact, Christians have killed each other over some of these things, over things like infant baptism. The Thirty Years' War was predicated in Europe to a large degree on these confessional differences between, not just between Catholics and Protestants, but between 
Lutherans and, and Calvinists. I mean, there was also that stuff going on as well, these, you know, these differences of opinions. And so it wasn't just fundamentalist churches performing my music. It was also a whole cross-section because it was out of the Bible. I was using biblical references for it. And I remember kind of early, it, there's a four or five year process from starting to ending. And early in that process, I was at a church and usually before I would get up to preach or, or sometimes I was, I was doing more preaching and, and music, kind of you know mixing it up a little more. We'd meet in the pastor's office. Almost always there'd be like a pre-prayer, just a short prayer to bless the meeting and dear God, you know, hope your Holy Spirit blesses Reverend Barker's ministry so that the Holy Spirit, you know. And then the, in that office, the minister said to me, um, now our church is pretty evangelical, um, pretty conservative, but you know there's a couple of members of our church who don't think Adam and Eve were literal historical people. And I was thinking, what? And you let them be members? <laughs> what? And he said, he said, don't get me wrong, I believe they were historical because it doesn't, Genesis doesn't say this was a parable or, or a metaphor, it just, you know, I, I believe it, but these people in my congregation they think that just like when Jesus told the parables, you know, like the parable of the prodigal son, was there really a prodigal son in history? No. Jesus made up a story. And it doesn't matter that he made up the story because it's the message that's important. It's, 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 not the act, it's not necessary that the prodigal son had a social security number and an address. I mean, he, he was a real, I mean, it, it, it's, a, it's a fable. It's a story. It's a parable. And the important thing is the lesson that's being taught through that, you know. And so this minister told me, these people in my congregation think that if Jesus could make up stories to illustrate an important spiritual truth, well, then the early Israelites did the same thing with Adam and Eve in the garden. It was a story they made up that no one even back then thought was literally true, just like nobody in Jesus' day thought there really was a prodigal son. Um, so they made up the story about Adam and Eve, and, and it's the important lesson about the fall of the human race and the culpability and the need for a Savior and all that. That's, and I was shocked because that's liberal talk. I was thinking, whoa, wait, that's not right. Maybe there'd be a point if, if somehow in Genesis it said, here comes a parable, but it didn't. <laughs> it just tells the story, and, and God, you, otherwise you're saying God's a liar, and I couldn't buy that. But I remember thinking about that how crazy some Christians can be. How can, how can Bible believers have these weird, wrong beliefs like this? What's wrong with them? And, but over four or five years, I started moving, gradually meeting other types of Christians. And, and after a year or two, I think it was also, I was just kind of growing up. I was in my early 30s by then. And Robert Sapolsky, a scientist out of Stanford, uh, he's got a great book, The Primate's Memoir, he spoke at our conference once. Uh, he says that the frontal lobe of our brain is the most recently evolved feature of the human primate. And therefore, it is the last thing to finish developing. We don't just come out, we're not just born fully developed. We, we're developing even through our lives. And uh, it doesn't fully develop until about the mid-20s. And he, said, he thinks that it happens faster with women than with men which probably explains a lot. Um, it, the frontal lobe is the part of you that, that checks, that's got the social moral restraint over your basic animal instincts. The frontal lobe is kind of like you're finally growing up when that thing finally matures, if ever, I guess. Uh, I know some guys in their 50s that I'm wondering. Um, but it's the part of your brain right, that right now is keeping you from burping out loud if you wanted to. It's the part of you that's, that's kind of holding back. We have our basic animal, but we also have this part of our brain which our species evolved. And so that I, something felt different in my mind. All of a sudden, I started thinking that, hey, you know, there's more to learn here. There's people with different points of view. This, these ministers that I'm meeting, they're not stupid. They're not bad people. But they have a different theological view from me. And wait a minute. And, but I have the truth and they don't, but wait a minute, they're nice guys. And so I, all this stuff was going through my brain and I think it was all coupled with just growing up and the fact, darn it, that Jesus hadn't come again. <laughs> if only he had kept his promise, you know, and he just didn't return. Maybe tonight, we'll have to wait and see, but maybe tonight. Uh, what does he say, midnight, is that the time? 
What did Harold Camping say? I don't know, but sometime today. It's supposed to be the day. Um, so I, uh, it started within me all of a sudden this huge hunger to read. I had been delaying all that. If I had gone to a real liberal arts university <coughs> or college instead of a Christian one where, you know, I didn't, I got good grades in college and I studied New Testament Greek and I graduated with a good GPA, but I didn't care. I thought, why do I need to study all this stuff? Because the world's ending. Why do I just need to be preaching? I did a lot more preaching than any of my professors, I'm sure. And I, you know, they were all book learning and stuff. And, um, but in my 30s, all of a sudden, there was just like this immense hunger. All of a sudden, like I've been, you like, when you have a, a, a silent hunger, you don't realize it until the last minute. And then suddenly, whoa, you're hungry. And I just something woke up where I just wanted to learn not about atheism. Not about evolution, not about any of the, those things. I just wanted to learn more about my faith and read and study. The, and I've since realized that most of the ammunition that's critical of Christianity comes from within Christianity. It's the Christian Bible scholars who believe, but they have modified their beliefs. If you're going to be an atheist and do debates against Christians, study the Christian apologists. Study them, because they come up with the, the Bible scholars. They know the Bible. They know it. Uh, Hector Avalos is one example. Uh, the, the first Hispanic to get a PhD from Harvard in biblical languages. He's from Nogales, Mexico. In fact, he was a kid there at the same time I was preaching there. So we might have we met. Who knows? But uh, anyway, Hector was a, a kid preacher too. And Hector fell in love with the Bible as, as a, a, a human book. He became an atheist, but he still fell in love with it. And now he's a highly respected um, at Iowa State University, a highly respected Bible teacher, religion teacher, and the students know he's an atheist, but they love taking his class because he just loves the ancient languages and all that. And I had the same idea. Suddenly, my interest in the Bible switched from being just this devotional book where you're getting spiritually fed to, oh, look at this. What are the, what are the words? What was the culture of the time? Well, who was it written to? Why was it written? How does it fit with history? How does it fit with science? How does it fit with um, other cultures around it in that? So... I went through this migration, and suddenly after a couple of years of that, my, I was still preaching and still believing, but my sermons were less hell and more love. My sermons were less about the afterlife and more about living this life, which is kind of the standard Sunday morning fare when you go to church. How do you let your light shine before men? How do you become a Christian witness? How do you show your love? That kind of stuff. And I was growing up, I guess, and becoming less hard-nosed, absolutistic about, you're going to go to hell and you, if you don't, you know, that kind of thing, into more of just a grown-up, I guess. And thinking all the while that every little move that I made was the last one. I thought, oh, this, now I've finally grown up. Now I know something. Well, I've finally learned, you know. But I'm making a long story really short here because, uh, and I explain it all in, in Godless in greater detail. The, some of the theological questions and some of the reasons for doubting the resurrection of Jesus, for example. Um, but um, I started moving over to this side as a few more years passed, and suddenly I realized, as I was reading more science and more philosophy and starting to reading, actual reading things, that my definition of God had changed. Over, and I was over here more. I became one of those hated liberals that God would want to spit out of his mouth because they weren't hot or cold. Do you know how liberal Christians talk? You know, I've debated some liberal Christians and it's like trying to nail jello to a tree. It's like, what do, they, what do they really stand for? What do they really believe? I mean, come on. It's easier to debate and more fun to debate fundamentalists because they're honest. They state what they believe. and you know, So you can have, I debate uh, Calvinists and Calvinists are uh, quite firm in what they know and what they believe and what they say. And so it, the debate is good. But if you debate a liberal... You agree on almost everything, so what's the point? But I became one of those in my own thinking. All the while, I was still outwardly preaching and doing altar calls. In my own mind, in my own searching, in my own thinking, I was like, I, I need to know more than this. I remember driving the freeways of Southern California, thinking about all this and praying and, and thinking about the human brain and thinking about all And then this little voice in the back of my head was saying, it wasn't this father figure voice, it was this Dan Barker voice back here saying, Dan, admit it. Something's wrong. Admit it. Just, just admit something's wrong with the way you think. You're not this 
know-it-all. You're not the person who, after centuries of religious division, you're the guy that's got it all figured out. You're the guy that's going to tell the whole world that your theology is the right one. Every denomination of Christians, everyone can open the Bible and prove to you that they have the right interpretation. And the others are off in some way, or they're even heretical, right? They can all do that. I could do that. I could open the Bible to you and say, read it with an open mind and an open heart, and you'll see the truth, which is the way I see it. You'll see it the way I see it. But of course they don't. Human beings are not like that. There's all these different interpretations. And I realize that when Paul said in the Bible, God is not the author of confusion, can you think of a single book that's caused more confusion than the Bible? <laughs> really, think about it. Everyone thinks they have the right way and they all disagree with each other. It's things about where do you draw the line between what is literal and what is metaphorical, for example. And uh, I got to this place where I started realizing, well, you know, the prodigal son is a parable and Adam and Eve are most likely a metaphor because now from evolution we know there couldn't have been an Adam and Eve. There just couldn't. It's impossible. So it had to be a, a metaphor. So if that's true, then maybe even God himself is just one huge figure of speech. Maybe God himself is just a big metaphor, a way for the human race to tell a parable, a story about our existence that gives us meaning in some moral way. Does he actually have to exist like the prodigal son doesn't have to exist? Does God actually have to exist in order for those narratives to be meaningful? And that's, that's very liberal theological talk, right? You, hear, you sometimes hear pastors from the pulpit saying things like that, not from evangelical pulpits, where God is this real being. Uh, but I moved over into that start, and I started reading people like Tillich and others, and, and uh, I forget most of what Tillich said, but I remember thinking he just didn't have the courage to make the final step. You know? he, he defined God in such vague terms like, what did he call God? Uh, the ground of all being, I think, is what he, that's what God is. God's the ground of all being. Well, why not just call that the ground of all being? You know, why call it God? Some of them say, well, God is the bond of commonality that unites humans in a, in a purpose. Why not just call that the bond of humanity that unites us in a purpose? Why put a word on it, you know? And I moved all the way to this edge in my own mind, thinking and reading and, and still loving my, my Christian life. And it was weird because... Remember driving on those freeways, this voice is saying, Dan, something's wrong. But over here, this voice is saying, yeah, but I'm talking to Jesus right now. Don't bother me, I'm talking to Jesus. But are you really? What? Yeah, what, because, but it feels right. Yeah, but all religions say that. Every, you know, but are you sure that you're not just talking to yourself? No, because, but, you know, and so it's like this eyeball that's looking around the world. Look at those, look at those Hindus. Look at those Muslims. Look at those wacky Mormons. Look at those, you know, look at these... And then suddenly that eyeball went like this. And that was weird. I became my own science experiment. It's freaky. It's really a freaky thing when you know you have the truth and you know it's real and you feel it. And I can still reproduce those feelings right now. I could still I could feel this presence and talk to this being who isn't there. But um, it, it was like a humbling thing that happened. It was like, a, it was like wait a minute. I'm the know-it-all, right? I'm the guy who's got to have this absolute truth, but what do I know, you know? And for me, at least, and I have other atheist friends who were raised religious, they say the same thing. They were brought down a few notches. They were brought off of the arrogant high horse or the narcissistic idea that we are specially chosen or that a group of people is a chosen people or that a certain church is the, the true church, you know, that kind of thinking, which... Basically, all it does is it creates divisions in our societies. It cre builds walls. It creates an in-group and an out-group. I got to the clear end edge of this migration, and it was in the summer of 1983, and I realized, you know what? Let's be honest here. There really is no evidence for a God. A simple way to, to point that out is that if there were evidence for a God, think about it, by now someone should have won the Nobel Prize for that. Really, if there is a hitherto unknown force in the cosmos that there really is evidence for, put it on the table, let's see it, let's test it, let's verify it, then let's, somebody should win, anybody, any scientist in the world would jump at that chance because that would be a fact of reality. That would be a fact of the cosmos. So let's, let's get with it, let's have it. 
But there is no evidence at all. The resurrection of Jesus turns out to be probably the worst evidence anyone could ever offer for uh, the truth of the Bible. And I've done debates on that as well. There's no evidence. There's not even a, a coherent definition of a God. How can you argue for something that you can't even define? And so many definitions of a God are mutually contradictory that some of the definitions, you, don't, you can say more than just that there's no evidence. You can just say that God doesn't exist. It cannot logically exist. It'd be like arguing for the existence of a married bachelor. You, you can't. It's just logically impossible. And there's some definitions, even Christian definitions of a God, that are like that. They fall apart internally. Uh, and there's no agreement among believers about this God or its moral principles. There's no good arguments for a God. Uh, the first cause or the design or teleological or ontological or Bertrand Russell. I remember reading Bertrand Russell. He said when he was a young man, he was briefly convinced that God was real by the ontological arguments. It's an obscure argument that you don't hear much anywhere, but there's a few people. Um, what's his name out of uh, Oxford? Um, uh, Swinburne and some others are still promoting it. Uh, but then the next morning, Bertrand Russell woke up and he said, oh, it's all just bad grammar. <laughs> and when he thought it through, it's wordplay. It's just bad grammar. And so there are no good arguments, and if there were, they'd be out there, right? Why, if there were, we wouldn't be having debates, right? It would just be out there. It would be something that we could uh, examine and we could agree on. We could all pretty much logically come to the same conclusions, and we don't, and we can't. And then I realized there's no, of course, there's no good reply to the problem of evil. There is none. Uh, and because of the problem of evil, some theologians have had to tinker with their definition of God. Something has to give. Uh, some of them give up uh, omnipotence in order for the problem of evil to be acceptable. And finally, there's no need for a God. I realize there's millions of good people. I hadn't met them yet, actually. I hadn't ever met another atheist knowingly. I probably met a lot of them, but not knowingly. And that should tell you something right there. When you meet an atheist, shouldn't, you, shouldn't it be obvious? I mean, you know, these, the Bible says, uh, the fool has said in his heart there's no God. They are all corrupt. They have never done a single good thing. Well, it should be pretty clear who the atheists are, but they're just like anyone else, atheists and agnostics. And so I became, in my own mind, this brand new baby atheist the summer of 83. And it was... Um, I was all alone. I didn't know anybody else. And I, I think that's kind of cool because it makes it my thoughts. It wasn't like somebody came to me to convince me. It wasn't like some skeptical, atheistic evangelist came to my door and convinced me that I needed to join this movement of theirs. Or I saw some agnostic evangelist on TV that I jumped on the band. You know, it wasn't that. It was just me and my own thoughts. And I think with many of you in this room, it was like that, right? It was your own thoughts which makes it precious. You own your own freedom of thought and you're coming to your own conclusions, not because you're being told what you must believe, but you're thinking it through on your own. It's a bottom-up thing, not a top-down, forced kind of thing. So I should have stopped preaching right then. I should have just said, yep, I don't believe anymore. I should have just stopped. But, you know, how do you stop a lifetime of ministry? I still kept going for about four or five more months. And... I had dates on the calendar, and by that time, I was not connected with the local church anymore. At that time, I was accepting invitations to preach and do music, and I was doing record production, but I was also getting interested in computer programming, and I was taking some classes, and I thought, you know, maybe this would be a good job, because I don't think I'm going to keep preaching much longer here. But I was still on the weekends and a lot of evenings going out to preach, and I was a hypocrite. I admit it, for about four or five months. I should have stopped, but it was like, how, you know, what? Um, and was I totally sure at the time? I guess I was, but, you know, it, was the, it, was, it wasn't a nice, clean break. But I'm kind of glad I went through those months because um, people would, after I'd be preaching, I, shouldn't, I, I was hating myself. I shouldn't be saying these things. I don't believe these things anymore, but I, I was so good at it, and the audience is, praise God, and God bless you, and the Holy Spirit, you know? Uh, people were coming to get saved. Um, and I remember after one sermon, a woman came up to me. And she said, Reverend Barker, I just want you to know, I really felt the Spirit of God on your ministry tonight. And I was thinking, he did? You know? <laughs> and so that tells you something, doesn't it? That tells you something about what's going on with this drama 
there's a minister up here preaching and there's a congregation and they have roles to play in and people are coming to feel what they're going to feel. And more emotional people might go to a Pentecostal church and more intellectual people might go to a mainstream. But we, you kind of pick the church that fits who you are as a person. And uh, I remember it was sometime during that summer, I was down in Mexico, just across the border in Mexicali there. There's these little ejidos down below the border, um, little villages by the canals. And I was in this uh, adobe church, and there was no, no glass in the windows. And I was sleeping in the little Sunday school room with a burlap cot there. And uh, that was the first time. It wasn't a religious experience, but it was something like that. It was the first time in my life when I realized, I was looking out the window at the stars and looking at how deep the universe is. And I realized for the first time in my life that I was actually alone in that room. Just me. I was just alone. There was no big eyeball of judgment analyzing my every thought. There was no principalities and powers and demons and wrestling for my future of my soul. There was none of that. I was just this biological organism in a natural environment, just like those stars up there were ingesting material and then burning and shining and then finally dying off. I'm kind of this little low wattage star ingesting material and glowing faintly in the universe and here I am and I'm going to burn out someday and that's it. And it was kind of a bittersweet moment because I, at that moment I realized I had totally lost all illusions of transcendence and that I was the special creature that was going to live on and I realized for the first time in my life who I am. I'm an animal. I'm a biological creature. It was almost like I could shake my own hand and say, hi Dan, Inter let me introduce you to yourself. Here's who you really are. It's not a pretense. You are this evolved biological organism, for better or for worse. And um, it was kind of scary. It was kind of exciting too. It, it's kind of like uh, if you're going to go skydiving or do something like mountain climbing. Or something. You're excited and you're afraid at the same time. You have this adventure feeling. And I thought, you know, life's going to be different now. I kept preaching and I was thinking, I got to stop this. It was December of 83 when I preached my very last sermon. And it was, uh, it, there was these two churches, one in San Jose and one in Auburn outside of Sac Sacramento. And I forget the arrangement, but one, one of them flew me up there and the other one was going to fly me back or something, I forget. Um, and the church in Auburn, it was in mid-December, and they were meeting in a high school there. It was a church meeting in a high school. They were renting the high school auditorium. And uh, we met before the meeting, I and the pastors and the staff, we, like a football huddle kind of thing, you know. And uh, I was to do preaching but music, and it, they were billing it as a kind of a Christmas program. So I did some of my Christmas musical stuff, and then I would stop and preach short sermon kind of things. And we were in this huddle, Praying, dear God, bless Dan's music tonight and his ministry. And, you know. and then one of the staff said, and also, God, we ask you to bless Harry. We really ask for your outpouring of your spirit to bring Harry to Christ. And, and so they explained to me that Harry, for the first time, was coming to church. Harry was the town atheist. And they said, Harry's a great guy. Everybody loves Harry. He's a respected businessman in town. Harry will give you the shirt off his back. He's a great guy, but he's not saved. He's not a Christian. He's an atheist, and he needs to be saved. Well, Harry had just remarried this younger woman who became a born-again Christian, and she said to him, why don't you come to church with me? It's going to be like a musical Christmas thing. You, you like music. And, and apparently, Harry said, okay, yeah, sure. You know, I love my wife. I'll go to church with you. you know. Um, and she must have got on the phone or something because everybody knew that Harry was coming to church. She must have like, he's coming, he's coming. So everybody's praying for Harry. And so they were praying for me then to bless the meeting so that Harry could see the truth. And I was thinking, oh, I can't do this. I can't, this is not right. This is, this is dishonest. This is hypocritical. And, and uh, I don't believe this. And I, you know, but I... I went and I went out there and it was like a spotlight. It was a stage thing and I couldn't really see anybody out in the audience too well, but I knew there was Harry out there. <laughs> and I, I knew there was an actual atheist in the room. And I did my stuff and they liked it and they clapped and they said amen. And I was playing these songs with singing these really stupid lyrics that I had written. And, 
And at one point, I almost stopped. I almost stopped and said, this is crap. <laughs> Harry, you're right. Harry, we <laughs> But how do you do that? I mean, it was like, what would I have done? Just walked out into the night? And besides, they hadn't given me my plane ticket home yet, you know? <laughs> It was, I was stuck. It was, a, it was horrible. It was like, it's like, and so I remember thinking, okay, I'm a professional. The show can go on. You know, like Pagliacci, he, his heart's breaking, but he has to go out and make people laugh, you know, that, that, that opera. I felt like, I can do this. All right, I can, I, you know, they're expecting it. I guess we have an agreement. I'll finish this thing, and I did. And I thought, okay, I'm not going to do any more. I can't. But then the pastor invited a bunch of us over to his house afterwards, and uh, I just wanted to get my plane ticket and go home. But uh, I, stayed, I think I stayed at their house that night. I forget where. But, um, and they invited Harry and his wife over to the house, too. And I, don't, I think I shook his hand. I couldn't look him in the eye. And I, you know, I, I, was just, I just couldn't talk. You know? I was sitting by the, in a chair right by the Christmas tree. And the pastor got up and said something like, uh, isn't it wonderful we can all come together to celebrate the birth of our Lord Jesus Christ this time of year? And a voice from across the room said, Not all of us. <laughs> and I remember thinking, Wow. <laughs> Here's a guy, he's unafraid. He's different. He doesn't mind that he's different. He knows the whole community is condescending and praying for him like he's got a social disease or something. But he's secure, and he knows what he thinks, and he's not afraid to be different. Those four words were, like, so powerful. You know, they were real words. They were a real human being saying real words, not more powerful than all the hymns I've ever sung or all the sermons I've ever preached, just a real human being. And so I went home, and I never preached again. I wrote a letter. I sent a letter out to everybody. It's just a one-page letter, which I reproduce in the book, the book Godless, and um, telling people I don't believe anymore. Don't invite me to preach anymore. Well, you could, but it would be a different sermon, you know. But <laughs> and uh, I remember it was uh, mid-January. I finally worked on that letter, and I finally sent about 50 years, I don't know, 40 or 60 envelopes to all my relatives, all my Christian friends, co-missionaries, Christian publishers. And um, I remember in, it was in, I was living in Ontario, California, when I dropped those letters into the mailbox. This is kind of an important moment, and I let him go, good, I'm over with this. Um, in fact, I wrote a little note at the bottom of the letter to, to Gospel Light, because I was right in the middle of writing one of their VBS mini-musicals. I had two more songs to write, and I told Wes Haystead, I said, I, it's fine with me if you want to find another person to finish this job. It's fine, because I, I don't think I should be doing this now, and you shouldn't want me to be anyway. And he called me on the phone and he says, well, Dan, we're on a budget and we're on a deadline. We've got to get this done. Translation, I was cheap. Um, and I was, but I got it done for him. And I said, well, listen, um, you know, I don't believe this, and I'll do it for you. I felt like it was a contract and I couldn't let him down. And I said, how about if I use a pseudonym? Would that work if I use it? And then that would save both of us the embarrassment. So if you ever do see the Gospel Light mini musical called Sunrise Island, written by Edwin Daniels, <laughs> you'll know that that was written, part of the songs were written by an atheist. And they were performed in churches and schools and people liked them. And, and you know, I, I guess I did a good job as a craft of writing the songs. That's happened before, by the way. Ray Vaughan Williams, who wrote many of the hymns for the English hymnal, he was an atheist. He didn't believe any of it, but he said, if you're going to go to church, you may as well hear good music. So he wrote, <laughs> he did, and he wrote all these liturgies that they performed in churches all the time. Um, and others, other religious songs have been written by non-religious people, so I, I since realized that. Uh, so I sent that letter out, and the um, responses were all across the board. Everything from really nice, warm, loving responses from Christian friends and relatives who were still friends today, which is kind of neat. To, on the other side, I got some surprisingly unexpected, ugly responses from people that I thought were friends, and apparently it was just too much for them. That's a great way to test your friendship, by the way. <laughs> it really is. If, if your friendship is contingent on being in the same group, being part of the same, you know, then and it, what happens if that contingency disappears? Is your friendship still there? 
A true friendship is a mutual admiration and respect for each other as human beings. So some of us still have that. In fact, I'm going to go see one of my Christian friends in um, the Stockton area on, on, on Monday. We've been friends since Christian college, and uh, we like each other as people, even though our views are different, which is, which is kind of neat. It shows the friendship. But um, uh, my mom and dad, maybe, maybe uh, I'll tell you some more about that. We'll, I'll do a song. We'll have some questions if you want to ask about the things that happened since then. But uh, I became this brand-new baby atheist, and uh, that was January of 84. Uh, I read a book by a, a woman named Annie Laurie Gaylor called Woe to the Women, the Bible Tells Me So. And I thought, wow, the Bible's treatment of women in law. I wrote her a letter, and I said, thanks for writing this book. And I told her a little of my story. And she and her mom had started the Freedom from Religion Foundation in the mid-'70s. So they said, well, could you write an article for our newspaper? And I did. I wrote an article for... Um, I think it was uh, June of 84. And then I got a call from a woman in Chicago. I was in California. And she was a producer for a show by a, with a woman who was a host. Her name was Oprah Winfrey. Oh. And, <laughs> and she said, uh, we're going to have Ann Gaylor and Annie Laurie Gaylor on the show to talk about atheism on Oprah Winfrey's show. And, they, and we asked if, there's, if they know any other good stories. And they told us about you. So I flew to Chicago. That was the very first time I ever publicly spoke about atheism. It was the very first time I ever publicly spoke before a hostile audience because Oprah had packed that audience with Bible thumpers. <laughs> and that's the very first time I had knowingly met any other atheists. Knowingly. And so I was scared for all these different reasons going to be on this show. And uh, it was actually great TV. We have a videotape of it. And Annie Laurie and I met that day. So we have a videotape of the day we met. And we've showed our daughter, Sabrina, uh, a couple of years ago. And she, Sabrina was laughing at that, not at how young we looked, but at um, that audience. Because there were Bible thumpers and, and there were Christians calling Annie Laurie a witch. And it was really exciting. And um, I found the words. I don't know how I found the words. I, you know, to publicly talk about it. And it, just nine months before, I had been preaching the gospel. And here I was... Uh, preaching the non-gospel. And uh, uh, anyway, um, in 1987, Annie Laurie and I got married, and we became co-presidents of the foundation in, 19, in 2004. And the group was growing fast, working to keep state and church separate and to educate the public about the views of those of us who don't, don't believe. When I was four years old I had a little friend named Joshua Whenever I was alone He would come over to play Cookies, cartoons, and punch He liked all the same things that I liked Cheerios and milk for lunch, kitty cats, balloons and kites. We were blood brothers, pals forever. We were as close as we could be. Nobody else could see him, but he was real to me Sometimes when I was sad I would send Joshua a letter He never wrote me back But he'd always come right over to play I'd never been to his house I knew exactly where he lived His daddy was oh so nice To let us have such fun every day We were blood brothers, pals forever As close as we could be 
nobody else could see him. But he was real to me. Now that some years have passed, when I was five years old, I just got so busy with schoolwork. Many new friends to get to know. Joshua moved away. Sometimes I missed him so. We had had such great times together. But I know he had to go. It works out much better that way. We were blood brothers, pals forever. He was my very best friend. Nobody else could see him. I now know he was just pretend. Now that some years have passed, I can look back and smile at my childhood, at the times when it hurt to grow up, like when Joshua moved away. Are we done or do we have time for questions or what do you want to do? Yeah, we do, okay. Um, and then maybe one more song. Uh, <laughs> okay. Hmm. Here's what one. What happened with your first wife? How did she take it when hmm? What happened with Carol? Um, we had a good marriage for a long time because we were on the same page. And to her credit, she tried to bend as far as she could without breaking. Uh, I was also discovering feminism too, which I thought was so cool because with feminism, you're equals. You're, you're like this, you know, there's no, nobody's above the other, which I thought the most exciting kind of relationship would be when you are equals and you're loving each other as people, not because you're, you know, there's some conditions there. But she couldn't, she couldn't bend too far. And um, she always viewed herself as a minister's wife. That was her place. That was her purpose in life. We divorced, and she remarried a Baptist minister. And um, they seem happy, and I think that's her place. And uh, it was sad. Divorce is always, always bad. Um, then I met Annie Laurie a couple years later. We got married in 1987. And there's an egalitarian relationship. Annie Laurie kept her, we both kept our birth names. And um, we, you know, we're, we are married, but it's like we still are separate people. We have our, our own bank accounts. We have our own lives. And so if, if she's ever buying me a gift, it's coming from her income. And, you know, it's that kind of thing. We, we like the whole feminist idea. But uh, the kids at the time, I had four kids, uh, and they're grown now. And uh, to Carol's credit, she agreed with me that the children should never have to be in a position where they have to choose between parents. And so the kids, she took them to church, and we just never talked about this stuff. And of course, they knew what was going on. They were figuring it out. And today, two of them, I think, are atheist or agnostic. One's atheist, uh, and uh, the other two are moderate. I don't know what they think, and I, I don't care. Because in a family, there's more important things to think about than what divides you. So. And then Sabrina was born in 1989. Annie Laurie and I have one daughter, and she's in college now. And the last chapter of the book, Godless, tells the story of the day of her birth, which was really traumatic. It was really a pretty amazing thing. 
um, in which through the whole thing, we never once thought of invoking some supernatural power. We invoked medical care is what we invoked, and, you know. So uh, my mom and dad later became atheists. That's kind of a cool story. Wow. My mom was a Sunday school teacher. Dad was a seminary student. And uh, my one brother, Daryl, also, of course, Daryl was always a lousy Christian. He was, um, <laughs> when I was a minister, I always thought he was way, you know. And, and Daryl, conf- Daryl to this day, in fact, he and I are really good buddies, and he's, he manages the f- forum for the Freedom from Religion Foundation. He's been an activist and state church guy. But he said that, you know, Dan, you're right. Back then, he said, my whole attitude toward Christianity was, Exactly how much sin can I commit and still get into heaven? You know, it was like. <laughs> but the other brother, there's three of us. The other brother, Tom, is still a born again, and he can't figure out what the heck happened with his family. We call him the white sheep of the family. He's the. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, it's awkward. He really is a deep, deeply believing born again. He loves uh, Rick Warren's book and all that stuff. But so uh, the few times we are together, we just decide to talk about what unites us. Well, you know, there's, luckily, we have a good, loving family, and that's neat. That holds us together. Every family is different, though, but uh, it's rare. I, my, my parents don't say that I brought them to atheism, but it got them to thinking, at least. And they're doing their own thinking, and then, because uh, I didn't want to be an atheist missionary to my parents. I didn't want to, you know, insult them like that. And then, but to their credit, they were thinking and reading, and they both came out of the faith, so... Back there, yeah. If you're going, if you're looking back now at the education that you're going through within uh, your college years, um, how did they respond to, uh, um, like, uh, you know, of course, all of the firms worked about uh, you know, different copies of the Bible, which one you're using, which story are you going to believe in, um, outside pressures of, you know, the canonization of it. I mean, how, how was all that dealt with, and how did you come out of it still We didn't go very deeply into all of that. We really didn't. I took one or two classes on what they called Christian evidences, and it was just sort of a gloss over. Uh, I was, it wasn't a seminary. It was a Christian college. I got a degree in religion, and I got what amounted to a minor in biblical Greek where I could read, you know, I wasn't a great Greek scholar, but I could at least translate, you know, from the Bible. Um, so we didn't go into great depth, and I was a street preacher, and I didn't care. I thought, all those questions, they've already figured out. The scholars have got, so why do I care about that stuff? And I wasn't into any of that. I was into preaching, and the world was ending. So uh, there were probably other students who were going deeper into that, but not me. I was, you know, I was just this true believer preacher. But you're right. There's a lot of preachers in the pulpit who know too much, and they're not saying it. There's a, and I know some of them. In fact, I know more than 20 preachers right now in the United States who are in the pulpit who no longer believe. They're atheists or agnostics. There's a new group we just started uh, last March. Daniel Dennett, uh, the philosopher, Richard Dawkins, the scientist, uh, Linda Lascola, researcher, and me, and a few other people. We've started a group called The Clergy Project, and we just, had, we just announced the public webpage uh, two weeks ago, clergyproject.org. It's a new group that you can't join. Uh, it's, it's only clergy, uh, former or active clergy, who have lost their faith who can join it. Uh, we started with about 52 people, and now there's almost 100. And since the public webpage went up a couple weeks ago, FFRF and the Richard Docks Foundation, we joint, joint released it. Uh, we've had a whole bunch of new applicants coming through that. You can go on there and poke around and read some of the stuff that, you know, the forum itself is private. These ministers have to use pseudonyms, and no more than two of us know who they are because they'd lose their jobs. They're looking for ways to get out. Uh, and uh, they say the same thing you're saying. They went to school, and they read, and they studied the Bible, and they learned too much, and they realized, I can't say this to my congregation. There's no way, and they don't. So there's like a double dishonesty going on. Uh, as a Christian minister, there's things they're not telling their congregation. But now as an atheist, of course, they can't wait to get Some of them just can't wait. They've got to... But it's, uh, it's a career problem for them. Who's going to hire somebody with a divinity degree in this market? So some of them are getting retraining. And what we're doing in the, 
in the forum is we're, those of us who are out are sharing stories and resources, and it's like a safe house. It's like a place where we can kind of compare notes. And um, The two admins of the forum are active Southern evangelical preachers right now. They come down from the pulpit on Sunday morning and they go into their office and they get on their email to us. You won't believe what I just had to say today, you know. Um, it's pretty amazing. And uh, we're, we're printing up some of the stories. We also um, started a Facebook page called The Clergy Project. So anybody can jump in. If you want to go and, and interact with some of these clergy, they're using pseudonyms. Uh, and, and there's no guarantee that they're going to reply to you because they have to... They have to be very careful about their privacy. But anyway, uh, and Bart Ehrman is in the group. Uh, he's not as active because he's really busy, but he's also a good resource for a lot of... Have you read his recent book, Forged? Isn't that amazing? I knew little bits of that stuff, but I didn't realize to what extent he puts it all together. The forgeries that are actually in the Bible. But uh, Yeah. Yeah, yeah, I do have a chapter, and I, I expanded in Godless, the new book. Um, and I'm careful to point out, there's disagreement among skeptics, too, as there should be, um, and among atheists, that all historical claims are a matter of probability. And the points that I raise in that chapter about the historicity of Jesus uh, greatly lower the likelihood that he existed historically. But you can't prove the non-existence of someone. There might have been a first century self-proclaimed Messiah named Yeshua. There were others. There was a Judas the Christ. There was a Theodos the Christ. There were other self-proclaimed. So there might have been. But what we do know is that that caricature in the New Testament, that person didn't exist. It was a legendary overlay of maybe or maybe not somebody who really existed in history. So uh, in any event, you don't need a historical fact to start a religion. Who was my piano teacher? Her name was Ruth Siegel. She was a Polish immigrant at the Nazarene Church in Anaheim, California. And she, she taught me for two years. And after that, it was all self, self-taught. I played in Southern Gospel Quartets for... Uh, I woke up this morning feeling fine. I woke up with heaven on my mind. I woke up with joy in my soul because I knew that I was made whole. You know, when I was a teenager, I played in a bunch of church groups and then just learned over the years. Um, in the last 25 years, I've been doing jazz mostly, um, which I, I really fell in love with when I, after I moved to Madison. And uh, I play in jazz combos and uh, in some big bands and a lot of solo. I play country club uh, solo work. And uh, uh, I'll do a song. I'll do a jazz song for you. Um, I was reading Richard Dawkins' book, um, Unweaving the Rainbow a wonderful book, and he says that's his favorite book, in which he makes a plea, he makes a call for more science in the arts, to integrate them, to make science less of a, you know, abstract, and more of just a real thing. So I wrote a song, um, kind of like the way Cole Porter wrote songs. Uh, most of Cole Porter's songs could be sung by male or female, gay or non-gay. I mean, and he was a gay. He had to come out of two closets. Cole Porter was an atheist and gay. And uh, I really admired the way he put words together and wrote songs. So I wrote a song, a love song, that just assumes the fact of evolution and dedicated it to Dawkins. And it's, it's called, uh, and then I sang it. I got to sing it for um, Steven Pinker and his wife, Rebecca Neuberger Goldstein, last week at our convention. Because they both came, this power couple, came to our conference and they both spoke on the same night. That was pretty neat. So uh, I sang the song for them. It's called It's Only Natural. Thanks to Galileo for showing us our humble place in outer space. And thanks to Mr. Darwin for showing us the origin of the human race, which means that our precious romance 
is mainly the product of chance. And these feelings of love, so frenetic, are just genetic. It's only natural that I would want you. It's only natural that you want me. A million years of evolution had its way. So we can blame it on our parents' DNA. I move instinctively in your direction. Somehow you signal me to turn and see. You will always be my natural selection. As a voluntary choice, naturally. It's only natural that I would want you. It's only natural that you want me. A million years of evolution had its way. So we can blame it on our parents' DNA. I move instinctively in your direction. Somehow you signal me to turn and see. You will always be my natural selection. As a voluntary choice, Naturally. Okay. Wow. Thank you.